Graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Major moves. Power. Welcome to PhD Hard Talk, Dr. Jamie Pay. Could you please introduce yourself in terms of your work, your research, and what you're doing currently? Right, so I completed my PhD in 2021 and I researched um, women's responses and resistances to contemporary beauty ideals. And that was done with the Center for Women's Studies at the University of York. Um, and I loved, I loved, loved, loved my research. But what I loved even more was working with the postgraduate research community. And I really sort of fell in love with training and coaching and doing work around that while I was still doing my PhD. So right now I am a PhD trainer and coach working with postgraduate researchers, PhD students all around the world. Amazing. So I will start with the research because I'm intrigued and I've got questions. Sure. And I think yeah, you've looked at um, a few countries that I like. So you, we've got Singapore, cleanest country ever. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Uh, we've got Malaysia and then we've got the UK and your sample is like 42 people just to set the scene. So I'll go to the beginning. So in terms of beauty ideals, what does that mean to your research? Like, what is it? What is a beauty ideal? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> OK, so it's it's all the kind of societal, cultural and even small community ideals of especially in the context of my research where I was re researching feminine beauty ideals. It's really the notion of, of how a woman should present, how she should look like and what beauty is. And ob obviously, like that definition changes throughout times and across cultures. Um, but I was very much struck when I, in my former work as uh, as a journalist in a fashion magazine, um, I was very much struck by this question that came up over and over again around whether somebody was pretty enough to be featured mm -hmm. in the magazine, um, and it, that was that was really a very big part of me deciding to go back into academia and to do this research to kind of interrogate interrogate. And look a little more deeply at what it is that forms our, our, our ideals and ideas around beauty. So, yeah, I was looking at conventional and contemporary beauty ideals. So this would be, for example, thinness, um, pr particular ways of presenting um, in very feminine ways or hyper feminine ways, um, lightness of skin, whiteness all those kinds of ideals and speaking to women about how they responded to those ideals as well as how they were resisting against it, like how they were finding their own definitions of what beauty meant to them. Wow. Okay, so hearing that um, and also looking at the countries, which is like Singapore, the UK and Malaysia, I'm thinking that the beauty ideals in all these countries are quite different. So why choose like like different? They're quite different in terms of yeah. culture as well. Like they're quite diverse. What, what what was the thought process there? Okay, so actually the geography didn't matter as much as the sort of backgrounds, cultural cultural educational backgrounds. Um, class backgrounds as well of my participants. So part of, of deciding who I wanted to speak to um, involved thinking about how women create these ideas around beauty and, and their relationship to beauty within their own social and friend networks. Yeah. So I made the very deliberate choice of interviewing women that I already knew and who were in my network and my friends and their friends mm -hmm. so I, I acknowledge that this means that it's a very particular kind of woman with a very particular class and educational background and privileges um, and that was sort of an intention of mine actually it was it was deliberate I wanted to look at how um, these women who had quite cosmopolitan backgrounds so I 
I grew up in um, in Malaysia, but I went to international schools. And then I came over to the UK and had quite a diverse group of friends here as well from all over all over the world. Mm -hmm. So my participants spanned um, Kenya, um, the UK, of course, India, Malaysians, Singaporeans, um, and women within those groups as well had studied abroad in various different countries around the world, Australia, the US, the UK, Canada. Um, so it was really about tapping into how women of that particular sort of background and cosmopolitan class um, responded to beauty ideals and how they were kind of making their own way. And ultimately, I, I come to a conclusion and I argue that obviously because these women have particular privileges and they've had this sort of cosmopolitan international exposure, um, they are they have access to be able to respond and resist beauty in very particular ways that are, are perhaps not accessible to everyone, right? Yeah. And then, and then yeah, I think um, yeah, I'm thinking, okay, so if you're able to move from one country to another, you are right in terms of class system. Um, you're definitely on a different um, level to somebody who be native and they've never moved and they've just stayed at home, essentially. So they're exposed to different cultures and different ideas of, of, of beauty. So in your study then, um, did they conform to the ways of um, the US, for example, if they move from Malaysia to the US or were they quite like, no, I'm going to stick to the Malaysian ways of, of, you know, of my beauty and this is the way forward. What did you get from, from that research? Uh, okay, so this is so interesting. And again, it was, it was very much less about sort of which cultures and which specific beauty ideals they were adhering to. And instead it became more about my participants saying, I reject these beauty ideals, I reject femininity. Um, I'm going to make my own way. I choose how I see myself. And it became very much a discourse around um, individual choices around how they present, um, how they interact with beauty ideals or not. So actually, ultimately, my, my discussion became less about beauty in itself and more around this kind of contemporary like neoliberal and post-feminist um, way of thinking and living in the world and what I mean by that is that it becomes very much less about adhering to these social and cultural ideals and more about well I'm just going to forge my own way in the world I'm doing um, I'm making these decisions that are going to be best for me. Um, there were lots of discourses around um, like health, for example, professionalism, um, which I argue tie back into these kind of contemporary, again, new liberal ideals around success and individuality and independence. So it was very, in, instead of it being about the beauty ideals, it I argue that it becomes more around this ideal of like asserting yourself as this like independent, individual, strong woman. Um, and evidently, of course, that comes with very particular privileges. Obviously, not very many communities of women in the world do not have that privilege to be able to assert themselves in that, in that way. Um, so, yeah, it was really more of a challenge of the way our societies are built and the kinds of aspirations and ideals that we are feeling driven towards that are bit, like even bigger than, than just ideals around beauty and femininity. It's more around ideals of how to be in the, in the world as a quote unquote successful individual now. But then I'm thinking, um, did you find elements of the walk culture in terms of their choices because I think the biggest driver at the moment is that I'm woke so um you know there's no makeup on my face because I'm organic and I'm woke 
you know, I'm looking yeah. after the planet. So were there any trends of such? Um, I didn't discuss wokeness specifically, but I can see that it, it is very much more around, um, you know, or it's perhaps not so much wokeness as a as an attempt to sort of rally against like what were what were deemed as like older and outdated um, conventions for for women and for how they look as well as how they present and act in the world. I get is is that wokeness? I guess yeah, like maybe more about you know how you're creating your own place in the world and not letting like these larger authoritarian like powers that be define who you are whether that that power is like a larger conglomerate like the media or whether it's just within your own like ethnic community for example yeah I still think it's being woke <laughs> yeah oh, well yeah that's great <laughs> I just think, do you know, when when you've got um, this is my opinion, by the way, so don't come for me. Um, I think when you are comfortable, as you've stated, you have choice and you can make decisions um, and then you can run with it. And by running with it, you influence people around you. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm quite interested to, to, to understand in terms of their journey. How did they get here? And um, to which you've you've answered pretty much. But then now I'm thinking in terms of your research gap then. How did you get to a point whereby you knew that this was a you know an issue that needed research in? Um, I know you were a journalist and you've seen some things and you've you you know identified certain weaknesses and strengths in terms of um, the market, I'll call it, or industry. So how did you get to that point? Yeah, so my, I mean, my research took a lot of, uh, a lot of turns. So what I started off proposing is very different from what I actually ended up with in the end. Obviously, I think this happens for a lot of us, like what comes up in our data, what our participants say, brings up things that we possibly didn't anticipate in the beginning. Um, So what I had identified through, through the literature that I was reading, um, And I mean, there was a lot of work being done. There's a lot around the sociology of beauty and lots of lots of work being done around cultures of beauty. I mean, this is all the way back from like the the 70s or even beyond before that. Right. Like people talk about beauty and bodies so much in academia. Um, So, yeah, I mean, actually finding a gap in, in, in a field as big as that does kind of feel a little bit daunting, like, oh, you know, of course, there are all those moments of like, well, I'm not saying anything original and like, yeah. what am I saying that hasn't already been said before? Um, but as I worked through the research, I was recognizing that there were discussions around beauty. There were discussions around resistances, around um, more sort of general resistances as feminist kind of resistance. Um, There was also some discussion around class and beauty, but it was mostly, most of the kind of prominent texts were around like lower or a a particular kind of British middle class. Um, And I wanted, my gap, I guess, was trying to bring all of that together, like resistances by this particular class of women and how those um, resistances were being played out right now in this in this class of women. No, I get that. I think um, there were some words that you use like resistance, um, and also in terms of beauty standards and beauty ideals. Now I'm looking at the group that you've looked at, which is your friends, and they're well-traveled and well-seasoned in, in that way in terms of culture. So I'm just thinking in, in regards to them, um, what are their beauty standards? It's okay to say I'm not wearing makeup, that's my standard, but you mm-hmm. know, what do they perceive beauty as? Because to me, um, you know, look at my Sunday best sharp you know together yeah. it's, it's like contoured from top to bottom is like yeah. my best so you know in 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 their words 
what was their standard and and why were they resisting so much what what got them to 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 feel like you know what I need to resist this yeah that's such a good question um yeah and and again this this is sort of this contrasts with existing work around like class and beauty so uh, there was a lot of work that I was reading around for example um I think it was Beverly Skeggs, was it Beverly Skeggs? I can't remember who specifically it was. And Angela Rob- McRobbie, people like that, were looking at like lower, how lower class women were using beauty ideals as a way of uh, expressing social up, upward social mobility. So women would, for example, like um, get plastic surgery, they would make themselves up and that was aspirational for them. That was them like, putting themselves forward and trying to move socially move upwards Um, and I found that the contrast in the women that I interviewed was particularly interesting because they were very much like they were very um, almost kind of scornful and dismissive of those practices around beauty so they were very much like oh they would see that kind of um they would see that kind of hyper femininity as like frivolous as almost something that was like a waste of time or something that was um yeah like not substantial or, or you know it was in so instead what they were what they talked about a lot was about the sense of confidence and like in you know it was a lot of qualities of sort of inner quote unquote like inner beauty so um how 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 you carry yourself um how you are in the world the kind of um the kind of wider sort of values i guess that you held um there was a lot of emphasis around being healthy right so like um beauty was about like looking healthful and looking healthy being healthy there was also talk around like being comfortable with yourself and that that overlaps with confidence right like um dressing not to impress anybody but because you wanted to be comfortable um that you wanted to uh to dress in a way that not just feels physically comfortable but then allows you to like be most yourself and therefore most confident um yeah so it was that was it was again this ties into what I was saying earlier this is very much tying into that those kinds of discourses around like individuality and like your in independence how you're asserting that independence and confidence and um and your sort of success your place in the world rather than than the practices that you're that you're that you're doing onto your face or whatever does that make sense it does but then I'm thinking again um so I'm thinking of a woman let's say we'll pick Sri Lanka we'll pick India maybe in a village somewhere Mm-hmm. how do you think based on your model and your questions how do you think they would respond this is hypothetical um in regards to your research questions and also having because I think they see their beauty on tv and like magazines so I'm not sure if they would be woke they might be but do you think with your research models and the variables that you did identify you would be able to to get to a similar conclusion with the woke culture the way it's being shared on the internet on tiktok etc what are your thoughts um are you talking more about things like are we starting to get into the territory now of talking about things like body positivity that sort of culture yeah yeah it's I mean the I same ideals though it's still quite similar to the ideals because like like you said that you know I'm, I'm I'm listening to you me and my friends we've got similar views to your friends which right. is I do what I like get yeah. on with it if you don't like it sod off in it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> it's like it is what it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much but I'm just now thinking of the woman that's like you know she's the thing that she's looking forward to 
it might not be the career that you and I have. It might just be I'll get married and have my kids. And she's looking forward to getting doled up on her wedding day. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, yeah. what does that look like in terms of beauty ideals? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, this is what I was finding in my data and in the, the comments and responses from my participants. Doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with that. I, I you know, again, like I go back to that thing that, you know, being able to make those assertions mm-hmm. and even what we're saying right now, we're like, if somebody doesn't like it, you can sod off. Like that's, actually that that does come with certain privileges right that we're able to say that so this a woman in a village who I I don't want to sound you know patronizing or to kind of overgeneralize but somebody from a from a more traditional community for example from a um, a lower working class who may not have access to that social upward um, mobility um yeah, I mean, then they're, they are probably going to assert, or they, they may assert their choices, their definitions around what is comfortable and confident for them in vastly different ways. So I think, yeah, it is absolutely important, even for, for my participants, even for you and me, it's, it's, I didn't necessarily agree with, you know, my participants, um, being sometimes dismissive of hyper femininity and hyper feminine practices because that can be empowering for some women that is how some women that is comfortable for some women right that is that is confidence for some women um and and we we do always need to kind of contextualize like what is happening in that woman's life what you know what her values are and and all of that and and paying credence and honoring that as well um, thank you very much for for that response and I think um the the two key words or maybe three um that I picked up is um you know the fact that they were self-aware I think in your work is like self-determined and yeah. I can understand from from what you're saying now to say they're quite you know blasé with certain things because they've got choice essentially yeah. so which links into the next part of our conversation which is your PhD um, one-to-ones could you take us through that just to gain some understanding and if people do want to get in contact how do they contact you oh yeah so um, I know it's very different, like PhD coaching and supporting PhD students across their academic journey and, and across, you know, hashtag PhD life is is very different from talking about beauty ideals, right? Um, if I may just return a little bit to my to my research again, I think this this might be kind of relevant and, and important for setting up my my talking about PhD coaching. Um, A big part of beauty studies and and in in my research as well is this this big debate. This is very much a a big debate, I think, across a lot of social science research is this question of how much choice we we actually have. Right. So there's, there's this never ending debate between choice and agency versus structural constraints right so one camp says we do have choice we do have agency we should be able to assert those agencies and then there's another school of thought that's like well no you can never ever fully you know express your choices because we are always going to be constrained by like the societies that we live in and there are unseen powers always that will will mean that there will be specific repercussions that tied to the to the choices you make so you never really have full choice um and that was a that was a big part of my thesis um and in all the kind of thinking that I was doing all the way through and you know I as much as yes there's so much around like you know yes there are privileges there are constraints there are things that are problematic there is this big horrible society out there that is always going to be putting pressures on us whether it's in beauty whether it's in career choices whether it's in 
the research world, there are always going to be these forces, right? These unseen forces that feel constraining and pressuring. Um, but I very much, and this is like the coachy, like more spiritual side of me. I like to believe that, yes, you know, there are these there are these forces. There are always going to be these ex greater expectations and ideals. Um, but we have two choices. Like we can either sit there and complain about how problematic everything is forever and be miserable, or we can start to acknowledge that those those pressures are never going to.